So let's uh, go into uh, definitions a little bit uh, here. Um, you know, what is integrative treatment? Um, and uh, I'm gonna give you, at least from my perspective, um, some of the confusion in the industry. Um, you know, as I said, it's not only uh, does alternative uh, medicine often lack uh, rig rigorous science, but I think it's important to say there's mounting evidence that when patients select only alternative treatments, they unknowingly and potentially significantly reduce their odds for survival. I, I don't want to make light of how important that is. Uh, there is this new research that's been coming out that really kind of points out, you know, uh, how important uh, blending these systems is. And while we've all heard a case or two of someone who chose to forego conventional treatment and recovered from cancer, and I'll even show you an example, make no mistake about it, when you actually review the data, this is the exception, it's not the rule. So I define alternative in lieu of mainstream treatment. Not always, but often lacking rigorous evidence. I define complementary medicine as treatments that are generally single intervention add-ons to mainstream medicine. Oh, yoga, prayer, green tea, lycopene with breast cancer, with prostate cancer, with ovarian cancer, but they're usually single intervention add-ons. What I call integrative care are actually not what I call, but what the British Medical Journal called back in 2001, a selective incorporation of elements of complementary and alternative medicine into a comprehensive treatment plan alongside solidly orthodox methods of diagnosis and treatment. And in Life Over Cancer, what I really refer to the model that I think we should all be using globally for care is a systematic, comprehensive, multi-interventional whole system model with treatment strategies individualized to the patient based on objective assessments provided with a life-affirming and open communication between patients and practitioners. So that's the model that I'm gonna be focusing on through today. But just to point out one small piece of information of why I believe this is core and relevant. Uh, this is a study that was uh, done a number of years ago and it was an early breast cancer patient. And there are many research studies similar to this. And what uh, they uh, did was is patients with breast cancer who didn't complete their full course of chemotherapy, statistically had shorter survival. Um, so the patients received 28% fewer treatment cycles than planned, and it impacted their outcome rather remarkably. So in this regard, I still suggest, you know, an integrative cancer treatment plan providing major benefits um, we know that it improves quality of life. We know that patients that feel better and do better and improve tolerance have better outcomes. Um, what we also know is that um, research shows that anything that leads to the need to reduce treatment dosing, anything that leads to a delay in the interval between treatments, interrupted treatment schedules, or anything that leads to abandoning mainstream treatment actually shortens survival or worse with regards to patients' outcomes. So based on that, um, I'll tell you a cute story in 1981, um, a very important mentor of mine, Dr. Robert Mendelssohn, um, who actually uh, was uh, one of the people who started uh, Project Head Start uh, uh, many years ago and was uh, head of the licensing board of physicians for the state of Illinois when I came to study under him. He said to me one day, he said, Keith, if you stand in the middle of the road, you're going to get hit by cars on both sides. The truth of the matter is I built a career in the middle of the road, without a doubt. Back in the early 80s, 
I was getting referrals from two different camps because of a very strong interest in nutrition and cancer. Mainstream patients came to me responding well to treatment, but often were not tolerating their drugs at all. I also was getting patients referred by what I think you could have called at that time the alternative community. And many of those patients actually were feeling very well, but their cancers were progressing. And whenever I combined the best of both worlds for patients, it was undeniable. They did way better. Without a doubt, I came to believe that the middle ground is the optimal ground. So our model is really based on these three spheres. We know mainstream medical care as pathology and disease and treatment. And that has been an enormous component of the focus over these many years. Our medical and cancer treatment model has been limited to disease as pathology and treatment. There's been generalized attention about patients smoking and drinking habits, but it doesn't make for meaningful difference as it is not enough to really transform a patient's outcome um, in this regard. So we include additional areas. I would call this one's biography. Uh, historically, the conventional medical model ignored who a patient is, how they live, how they take care of themselves. And yet these are fundamental to getting well, to implementing programs, not only to tolerating programs, but to responding to programs. And I would equally say that um, the biology of cancer uh, in this regard is this terrain, this um, uh, micro environment. And um, possibly uh, more troubling in terms of our medical model as it has previously existed is there's a chasm between the bench and the bedside. Um, I first began recognizing the significance of the terrain, as I mentioned, in the 70s as a student. And in fact, I coined the term terrain at that time. From the get-go, I began testing and developing a practical clinical model really to assess and treat the environment. Because as I'll explain later, the cancer will actually hijack the soup, the microenvironment, for its own purposes. And we have to test it to know how to help patients hijack it back. Finally, in the 90s, there was recognition by the pharma research community that this extracellular environment was important. Uh, and that's when the term microenvironment uh, came into being. But even today, um, there's little, if any, practical relevance for patients in most clinical settings. And I will show you, and certainly my book uh, covers in great detail, how important this environment is to get it fixed. Um, uh, patients' terrain profoundly impacts every challenge that a cancer patient faces. So if I look at these three spheres, biography, who a patient is, how they live, uh, how they take care of themselves, your diet, your fitness, your sleep, your behaviors, all affect each and every one of the major challenges that cancer patients face. Tumor growth and survival, response to treatments, tolerance, management of toxicity, life quality, life-threatening complications, and even your life journal, journey. And also the same can be said about you know, one's biology um, with this and um, the same in terms of you know, even from a, a more conventional uh, model in this regard. Um, uh, um, so uh, I will you know, kind of talk a little bit more about you know, some of these as we kind of go through it today and give you more examples uh, clinically. But I, I do want to you know, kind of point out that um, I do use conventional therapy. Uh, I, we have a full chemotherapy unit. Um, uh, we use targeted therapies. We use immunotherapies. They all have their place. However, we're providing these in the context of an integrative treatment model with an optimal 
wellness foundation um, in order to reduce toxicity, uh, reduce resistance, reduce mutation while enhancing efficacy um, and while maintaining optimal life quality. So here's a, you know, just a, a kind of an example of a conventional path in this regard. Um, from diagnosis after a patient is first learning about uh, their disease, understandably that there is a significant life crisis that occurs, anxiety, depression, distress. Um, there are biochemical and molecular changes going on, often early on totally ignored, unfortunately. Outside of pain and uh, weakness, um, clinical changes are occurring that are often not addressed immediately with patients, while lots of diagnostic work is going on that's necessary and essential, but not enough. While the treatment begins, uh, patients often respond, um, but rapidly resistance comes into play, toxicity can come into play, and that will lead to further clinical decline and potentially disease progression. That leads to complications. Now, just for the record, uh, people don't generally die from cancer. It's a myth. People die from the complications of disease or treatment. Things like pneumonia, embolism, wasting syndrome, sepsis, things that are actually preventable if you build an optimal health foundation and protect patients up front from what generally takes patients' lives. In any case, these often in advanced cancers lead to further progression and death. And I'm proposing a bit of a different model in this regard, that from the moment of the diagnosis that we intervene with the life crisis with biobehavioral care, that we support patients emotionally, and we lay out a path for them that is optimistic and hopeful, um, and not often the fatalism that if you go on the internet and start reading as a patient, you know, can be uh, deathly all on its own. That we immediately start analyzing and testing patients biochemically, metabolically, immunologically, molecularly, so that we can do a full court press but that is selectively and tailored to that patient and not these generic regimens that are thrown at patients. Not only do they often not work, they can backfire in significant ways. And then addressing, of course, the clinical changes, not just uh, patients' general well being and performance status, um, and really uh, enhancing resilience through a variety of different interventions uh, with patients nutritionally, physically, where other uh, technologies exist that have been around for you know, uh, uh, millennia, uh, acupuncture and uh, various uh, physical care approaches. With treatment, there are a number of innovative things that can do while patients are being treated, address toxicity, reduce toxic metabolites from their system, counter resistance up front, not wait till it happens. Um, we do chemosensitivity testing. Um, we send tissue out um, to a lab in Southern California run by Dr. Robert Nagurney, who I believe is one of the speakers uh, in uh, this uh, presentation. Uh, chronotherapy uh, is a big area of our work. Um, uh, every drug has a window on a 24 hour clock when it's the most effective and least toxic. I'll come back to that. Um, uh, metronomic uh, therapy, therapies, off-labels, nutraceuticals, um, and more. And I believe because of this that we can get a very different outcome. And at least I'll show you some of our research data that would suggest this.